Greetings, eco-nerdlings. In this podcast, I'm going to be discussing the roles of species and ecosystems. So, each species plays a very specific ecological role called its niche, or its job in that ecosystem, what it does on a daily basis. Any given species can play one or more of five very important roles. It could be a native species, a non-native species, a keystone species, an indicator species, or a foundation species. So before we get started with this lecture, I want to make sure you understand what the vocabulary means whenever I talk about it. So make sure you jot down these vocabulary words. Native species. These are species that normally live and thrive in a particular ecosystem. Non-native species are the species that migrate in to an ecosystem. Sometimes it's deliberate and sometimes they get there accidentally like whenever they get carried from a boat that empties their ballast water from one area to the next. Indicator species are species that gives us early warnings of damage to the ecosystem, such as amphibians. Keystone species are species that have a role that has a very large effect on the types and abundance of other species in an ecosystem. And a foundation species. These are species that play a very important role in actually shaping their communities by creating and enhancing the habitats that benefit themselves as well as other species, such as beavers building dams. So again, we talked about what a species is in a previous lecture, but just to refresh your memory, a species is a group of organisms that can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. So ecological niche or a pattern of living. This means that everything affects the survival and reproduction of an organism's niche. So water, space, sunlight, and food, as well as temperatures, are very important to an ecological niche that an organism has. Generalist species have a very broad niche, meaning that they can survive in many different areas, such as a raccoon. They survive all over the place, and they eat a very broad variety of food so they can exist in many different areas. However, a specialist species is a species that has an extremely narrow niche and they can only exist in a very small area and they have a very small range of tolerance, meaning they might be extremely sensitive to temperature or external factors such as weather, humidity, that type of thing. So this is competitive exclusion principle, fundamental versus realized, as well as a generalist versus a specialist species. So there are two species of barnacle that was tested. And the Chthalamus barnacle right here, as well as the Bolinus barnacle. So they were looking at their areas. So the Bolinus barnacle can only exist on this line right here, because it still needs to be covered by water at low tide. If the tide gets too low, the barnacles from the Bolinus species will die or desiccate, meaning that they dry out. The Chthalamus ones are up here on top and they're good. Now they wanted to see if this was the actual niche that both of them inhabited or if there was something different going on. And that's exactly what happened. So they decided to remove the Bolinus barnacles. Whenever they got over here, they found that when those barnacles were removed, that the Chthalamus barnacles inhabited all over the area. So they could be underneath the tide as well as on top of the tide. So they were a more generalized species while the Bolinus barnacle was very specialized. Another example of specialized species would be the panda. Panda has an extremely narrow niche. It feeds on bamboo. And whenever we destroy their habitat or we take away the bamboo, the panda populations decline because they go starving and eventually they'll die. And again, like I was talking about earlier, a raccoon has a very broad niche. So it's a generalist. It can live in many different areas and it can get its food from many different places. More examples of specialized feeding niches are those of coastal birds. So here we have a black skimmer and it sees a small fish at the water's surface. The flamingo feeds on minute organisms in its mud, so it kind of uses its beak and it kind of rummages around in the mud and scoops it up. We have our swap and other diving ducks that feed on mollusks and crustaceans as well as aquatic vegetation. We have the brown pelican that dives for fish, which it then um, uh, locates from the air, so it uses visual cues. 
We have the avocet, which sweeps its bill through the mud and the surface water in search of very small crustaceans as well as insects and seeds. We have the Louisiana heron, which wades in the water to seize small fish. We have the oyster catcher, which feeds on clams, mussels, and other shellfish into which it pries in a narrow beak. We have the downwitcher that probes deeply into the mud in search of snails, marine worms, as well as small crustaceans. We have the knot sandpiper right here that picks up worms and small crustaceans left by the receding tide. We have the piping plover that feeds on insects and tiny crustaceans on the sandy beach. The herring gull is a tireless scavenger, so it kind of waits for all the other birds to find food. And as soon as it uh, notices that a bird has something yummy, it'll swoop in there and steal it. And we have the ready turnstone that searches under the shells and pebbles for small invertebrates. So all of these different species of birds survive in the same area because they all have specialized or different niches. They've learned how to share. So, case study, the cockroach. These are nature's ultimate survivors. There are already 3,500 species that have been discovered. They are really, really broad generalists, and they eat almost anything. They can live in almost any climate. They can even withstand extreme amounts of radiation. They also have very high reproductive rates. So what is the importance of a native species? So remember when we went through our definitions, we talked about native, non-native. So a native species is important to remember that first of all, every species in an ecosystem is there for a reason. Native species are a vital part of the food web in the ecosystems that they inhabit. Plants and animals that are native to the same area have adapted to one another so that the animals can eat the plants, but the plants have enough defenses to be able to defend themselves and able to breed and reproduce successfully. So non-native species. Sometimes we call these invasive species. These are species considered to be alien or non-native to an ecosystem. They can cause environmental harm or harm to human health. So an example to put it in a different light might be thinking about the Native Americans that lived on the North American continent. They were native there. They were there first. Whenever uh, the pilgrims came over and colonized, they spread a bunch of diseases to the Native Americans and that was very harmful to them. So problems that they can cause, they can cause economic harm. So if an invasive species comes in, it might destroy crops, it might destroy uh, ranching that we're doing with different types of animals. It can cause environmental harm as well as harm to us. So there are over 50,000 species that have been introduced into the United States in the past 500 years that were not native to the Americas. Not all of them are invasive, meaning they're not all bad. They're just non-native. Out of the 4,200 species of weeds that got introduced, 630 of them cause excessive harm. So how do invasive species get moved into them, into different ecosystems? Um, a lot of times we actually track them in. So if we go to a different country and we bring back mud, if we went hiking, we can actually have little seeds from different native species from that area and we bring them back home and all of a sudden we're introducing them there. Another thing that we do is whenever ships are sailing around, they take in ballast water and eventually they release that ballast water. So if we took ballast water from one ocean and released it in another area or another ocean, we could be introducing invasive species. So these are some species that were deliberately introduced into North America. We have the purple loose life, the European starling, the African honeybee, nutria, the salt cedar, we have our toads, we have the hyacinthus, we have the Japanese beetle, the hydrilla, and the European wild pig borer. So species that have been accidentally introduced, meaning we did not want them there, were the sea lamprey that attaches to, uh, to lake trout. And this devastates the trout population and it also affects humans that want to hunt them. We have the Argentina fire ant the brown tree snake, the Eurasian muffle, the common pigeon, the forsman termite, the zebra mussel, the Asian longhorned beetle, the Asian tiger mosquito, as well as the gypsy moth larvae.
So what are the ecological effects of invasive species? Well, a lot of times they actually outcompete the native species and the native species can sometimes become endangered as a result. They lessen the survival of the native species and they also lower the diversity of the native species as well. They reduce hunting and fishing potential for other animals as well as humans. And they can also destroy the aesthetics of the habitat, meaning what the habitat looks like. So indicator species. These are species that let us know that something's not right. So the plants and animals that by their presence or abundance or even chemical composition are able to reveal something about the environment that we can't really see. They're used as measures of habitat or ecosystem quality. So examples are canaries in coal mines, the global death of amphibians, spotted owl and old growth forests, as well as butterflies and frogs. These are all different types of indicator species. So for example, example, example um, the canary was actually used by coal miners. So they would take the canary into the coal mine and if the canary died or if it got really sick, the humans knew that it was time they needed to get out. So one of the biggest indicator species are amphibians. And why are they vanishing? Well, amphibians are vanishing due to habitat loss and fragmentation, prolonged drought, pollution, increase in UV radiation, parasites, viral and fungal diseases that come in whenever we introduce uh, non-native species to their areas, changing climates, overhunting, and non-native predators and competitors. <coughs> so why are amphibians so important? Well, they're very sensitive biological indicators of environmental changes because they go through so many different phases in their life cycle. So all different phases of their life cycle are susceptible to different environmental factors. Adult amphibians are important ecological roles in biological communities. They are a genetic storehouse of pharmaceutical products waiting to be discovered. So meaning that we can use them a lot for medicinal uh, uses as, you know, finding different cures for different types of diseases. So they're very important as far as research goes. A keystone species. Remember, these are species that have very important large roles in their ecosystems, and they affect the types and abundances of other species, such as pollinators like bees, and top predators. So an example of a keystone species would be the salmon. They're a critical fall food source for the grizzly bear, wolves, eagles, and otters, but they also act as a fertilizer for the trees. Whenever they go to the bathroom, their feces helps to fertilize their trees. Um, you know, sometimes the salmon actually aren't as uh, numerous as they're supposed to be. And whenever you see the salmon population decrease, you see the grizzly bear population decrease, the wolf population decrease, eagle population decreases a little bit. Um, but they're a very, very important species, especially up in Alaska. So another type of keystone species is the American alligator. They're the largest reptile in North America. And in the 1930s, hunters and poachers wiped out a ton of them. There are importance of gator holes and nesting mounds, and there are keystone species. In 1967, they got classified as an endangered species. But by 1977, they were making a comeback and got downgraded to a threatened species. So foundation species. These are the species that help to create or enhance their habitats, which benefit others. Examples of foundation species are elephants, because when they go through the forest, they break and uproot trees. Whenever they're breaking trees and uprooting them, it actually clears areas for grasses to grow. And when grasses are growing, that's going to bring in more species, so they'll actually help to increase the biodiversity. Beavers are another example. These are the ecological engineers, the nerdy guys. They build dams. They basically dam up water, so they actually change some of the ecosystems. They might make a flowing creek into a little pond, and that again will help other different species colonize that area. Well, I hope this was informational and helpful for you guys. 
If you would like to uh, keep up with me and my little nerdlings, you can follow us on Twitter or like us on Facebook. Twitter is at Queen Nerdling, and Facebook is www.facebook.com slash nerdlingscience. If you would like to see more podcasts like this one for AP Environmental Science or AP Biology, eventually, you can go to my website at www.nerdlingscience.com. Well, this is the Queen Nerdling signing out. Stay nerdy till next time.